10 minutes of priming um, you guys to ask good, smart, intelligent questions, and then 15 minutes of Q&A uh, in which she will answer your questions. So while she's talking, uh, be thinking of things that you want to know about the media. Uh, anything you want to know about the media, Jen knows. Yeah. Including all of their phone numbers and yeah. how to get in touch with them. Where to find them right now. Where to find them right now. She's got GPS and all the media. Um, I think if the questions are too intelligent, we might have a problem. Um, so welcome to the talk I didn't prepare at all. Uh, the reason is you can't do media training in 10 minutes. So this is not media training. I just want to be really clear on that. Um, I'm going to talk for 10 minutes about the media um, and uh, how to sort of think about it at a high level. And then I'll answer any questions that you have as far as I'm able to, provided they're not too, too intelligent. Um, and I'm sorry about my strange accent. It's the one I have. Um, OK, so the media. Um, I'm mainly going to focus on print and online rather than broadcast. Broadcast is a little bit different in the way that you approach it. And um, we're not going to really have enough time to get into the nuance of it. Um, so quick, quick thing on the day in the life of a reporter. Um, your average online news journalist probably gets somewhere between 200 to 400 emails a day. Um, of that, the mo large majority are pitches. Um, and by pitches, I mean they could be a press release, it could be a, a story idea, or it could be comment on something that's breaking news. Um, and so the reality is they're going to read a very, very, very small portion of those. Um, most online reporters that write for sort of news titles will aim to produce maybe one article a day. So when you think about press, you have to think about people who are inundated with information and really like the odds of you getting into what they're looking at are very, very small because you know, you're going through the, the sort of 300 down to like maybe the 50 they actually read and pay attention to, to the one thing that they pick as their story for the day and then whether or not you're relevant to that and how you're gonna get into it. So with that in mind, when you think about press, you want to um, think about relationships. Relationships are incredibly important. Building a relationship, being solid, being responsive, being fast on your response is the number one thing for any press. They are in a race. And I'm assuming that most of you are security people, um, hopefully. Uh, if not, this is probably the wrong group. Um, but if you think about it, like when you do research, uh, you know, if you find a vulnerability or Whatever it is, you are typically, you're in a race, right? When I talk to the Metasploit guys, they're always like very clear that like, you know, they're competing with the internet. Um, and, and it's the same for reporters. They're always competing with the rest of the internet. So for them, speed is the important thing. The way that a reporter's day works is they come in in the morning, they look through um, feeds from things like AP, anybody that, the, uh, sorry, that's the Associated Press, um, any of the wire services they think are actually worth something. Twitter is the, the big one for them. And then the people in security who have been around for a while will have certain groups that they follow um, and alerts that they get. So they'll go through all of those until probably around about like 9.30 or 10. By that time, they know what their story is for the day. And they're already starting to think about it. They want to have that story filed by noon. The story is filed by noon and it goes off to the editor, the copy editor who gets it onto the site. And at that point, they then move on to other things. They move on to other research, um, other opportunities that they're looking at. They clear out their inbox of all the shit that they didn't read for the morning. And so your, your window for, for tapping into the press is very small. You have to be really, really reactive, really fast. You don't need to send them a, a treatise that you wrote. Um, you don't have time for that. They don't have time to read it. They're not interested. They don't care. You need something like super to the point, keep it relevant, keep it easy to understand, know what their audience is, make it relevant to them, and make it easy to them, and, and tailor it as much as possible. Um, that's the major stuff. Um, when it comes to briefing press, most of the press in our industry are good guys. Uh, honestly, I, don't, I work with very few that are, are problem people. Um, most of them are really good guys. They're not out to trap you. They're, they're not trying to pull a fast one. That said, as I said, it's a very competitive space. If they don't know you and they don't have a relationship with you, they will rinse you if they think it's worth doing. It's, it's a complete like risk analysis in their mind that they will make. So you have to go into a situation knowing that. Um, there is 
there is a difference between on the record, off the record, and on background. Um, unless you have an excellent relationship with a reporter, and I mean really excellent relationship with a reporter, you're never off the record. You should assume that you're not off the record. You can go on background. What on background means is uh, that they can use the stuff, they can't attribute it to you. Um, so they can, they can take information from you and they can go off and they can talk to other people. And a lot of the reporters in our space are investigative reporters who will use that sort of information quite habitually. And they know that they get much better stories by having relationships like that. So they actually will normally honor on background. But anytime you talk to a reporter and you want to do that, you have to get agreement up front. You can't like share information and be like, wait, this is on background, right? That doesn't work. Um, so be very clear what the dynamics are with the reporter before you give them information. Um, if they are trying to get information out of you, there are a few key things that you can look out for. The biggest weapon in the arsenal of any good reporter is silence. Most people will try and fill silence. And if you do a briefing with somebody and they want to get something out of you, they will just stop talking. And you will fill that silence. So you, if you're going to talk to press, you have to get really comfortable with knowing what you want to say before you go in and knowing what you don't want to say. And just like being comfortable with the silence and with not, not trying to please too much. Because you want to have that relationship and you want them to think that you're a good person to come to. And you know the value of it. But that means that you can easily fall into the trap of overcompensating. Don't do that. Like, just be very clear in your mind of what it is that you want to cover. Know your major points before you go in. Practice them. Like, it sounds cheesy, but do it. Like, there's no harm in it. Get really crisp on it. Have no more than three main points that you want to communicate. And there is nothing wrong with repetition. Repetition is really good. Repetition will set you up so that when they walk out of the room, they know what their core message was that they got from you and there'll be less confusion. Um, other things for you to think about are things like, um, they, there's some other techniques that journalists use, like they do rapid fire, which is where they fire questions at you really quickly and they don't give you a chance to answer them and you get really flustered, and then they drop silence in and then you're like, ah, and then you'll splurt everything you know. So you just like, you have to be able to keep calm in those situations um, and don't be afraid to take control of it. Like if they keep firing questions at you, stop talking. That's totally valid to do it. And then you can say, okay, once you've let like a minute of silence reign, you can be like, okay, I'm gonna take those questions in turn and then go through them. You can totally take control back in a briefing. Um, so rapid fire, silence. Um, then there's the tangential question. It's always hard to know whether the tangential question is because they didn't understand or they're intentionally trying to take you off a side route and bring you back round in a weird way. Um, if you're not sure what they're getting at, clarify it. Like, literally say to them, so wait, do you mean this or do you mean this? Um, always feel free to ask a reporter questions. Ask them what they're interested in. Ask them what approach they're looking at for the piece. Ask them, um, uh, ask them, you know, hey, did you get this? Ask them, like, hey, am I making sense when you're, when you're talking to them? Like, it's always fine to take that moment and stop and say, is this, are you getting, like, um, it, it, does this sound right? Is it, does it, is it making sense to you? Because the stuff that we work with is nuanced, it's complex. These guys aren't people who code every day or hack every day. They write about it. And actually, they'll appreciate you taking the time with them to make sure that they get it right. So there's no, there's no harm, no foul in asking that stuff. Um, so with tangential questions, ask what they're really getting at. If they are rabbit holing, then you have two options. You can either let them investigate that rabbit hole for a bit, if you're interested in going down that route, or you can do what's called bridging, which is where you start to answer the question they're at, and then you basically build a little bridge back to the point you want to make. So you kind of pivot, basically, to put it in attacker language. Because um, I'm a badass hacker. Right, that. Um, yeah, so th those are the main kind of things. There are other things, obviously, as I said at the beginning, standardly media training can be a half day or a full day, so you're not gonna get full media training in 10 minutes. Um, but those are a few things for you to think about to kind of get a sense of it. Like, journalists are not bad guys. They're not your enemy. They're not trying to trip you up most of the time. But that said, you know, any relationship of this kind, you have to just be aware of the the, the context in which they, they work, and you have to, Try to do everything you can to set them up for success, 
And if you do that in the right way, you'll set yourself up for success and you won't end up in that situation where you, you know, it blows up in your face and it's awful and you hate it. That said, anybody engaging media, you should just go into it with your eyes open that at some point you will get misquoted. That just will happen. And you need to just be okay with it. Don't engage if you can't handle it. Because the reality is, turning around and blowing up the reporter isn't gonna be helpful. And most of the time, they, you know, they're just trying to get their job done. If it's something that's actually factually inaccurate, they'll mostly make a change if you ask in the right way because they don't want to look like idiots. But you also have to remember they have an editor that they answer to. They have readers that they've published something to. You don't want to put them in a situation where they feel like assholes, basically. Welcome to Sweary Hour with Jen. Um, so that's, that's probably my 10 minute blurb. I probably went over. Um, does anybody have any questions? Anybody? Uh, yeah, I, I'm happy to have a chat and to talk about some options. Um, there are, I, I have slides that I did for B-Side San Francisco that are revolting, but the reason they're revolting is because they're basically designed to be read so that you, they have lots of information in them and I'm happy to give them to people, yeah. Oh, this was easy. Yeah, you've had loads of media training. <laughs> and I will. <laughs> yeah, so we, I didn't talk about it in detail, but um, Lost in Translation is a, a very good point. Um, and you should just tell your story, because your story captures it the best. <laughs> mm. Okay, so... Um, Lost in Translation can work on two levels. Lost in Translation can work on an incredibly literal level where you're talking to somebody about something and it seems like it lands and then it gets translated into another language, which is what happened in Katie's case, and all of a sudden it becomes something ridiculous and you find yourself in lots of trouble. Um, or it can be much more like the case that's probably more common in security, which is that you're talking to somebody on a level that you understand that's completely comfortable to you and they're on a totally different level. And they're sat there going, what the fuck is going on? Um, the easiest way to deal with that is essentially to always assume that the reporter has about the general level of your grandmother. If you start in at that level, then let them dig deeper. Like if you're talking to someone like Steve Reagan, who frequently is my partner in crime when I do this, he's really, he's technical, he knows stuff, he'll get, he'll get into the weeds. But he's not going to be offended if you start at the high level. It gives him an opportunity to then dig down. But if you talk to somebody that I'm not going to use an example because it's just offensive. Um, <laughs> um, some other journalists. Um, then, you know, the chances are they may not be as familiar. And you have to remember, like, reporters are effectively jacks of all trade. So they're not going to have the deep, deep knowledge that you have on kernel exploitation or whatever your, your jam is. So um, you need to make it easy for them. And you need to go to where they exist and then, like, basically briefing the media is a negotiation. And in any good negotiation, you want to start where your adversary is and work them back to where you want to be. It's a persuasion, a seduction. Um, so that's basically what you're doing. Um, and so that, that basically counteracts loss in translation, but even then you'll still have the potential for issues where you'll say something that seems perfectly innocent and it'll get translated into another language where it's so much less innocent. And if you're lucky, it'll be a language that doesn't really impact your world too much. <laughs> and you should ask Katie for her example afterwards. <laughs> Any other questions? All right, apparently I was so, oh, oh, okay. Get them drunk. Um, <laughs> uh, actually, the, the main thing to it is, so, so how many people in the room work with PR people of any description? Okay, so I mean, <laughs> and Nick's like really of any description. <laughs> um, so if you work with a PR person, that's really their primary goal is to try and build that relationship. Um, and they will be successful on varying levels. Um, 
I, you know, one of my frustrations is that my PR agency has no relationships, and apparently I have all of them, which is interesting. Why are they not paying me money? Um, <laughs> yeah, so, um, but the reality is that coming to events and meeting with reporters is the best way to do it. Like, there's no substitution for meeting people face to face. Um, being friendly, being authentic is a really big thing. They like people who treat them as if they're human beings and not bugs. Um, you know, uh, just being straight up with people is good, treating them with respect, um, doing what you say you're gonna do. Like, if you, if you never overcommit, never overpromise, if you make them think you're doing one thing and you end up doing another thing, that will burn you pretty quickly. Um, and, and seriously, booze, they really, most of them really like a drink. <laughs> Anyone else? Yeah. So, uh, what Sean, Mike, Sean Michael Connor, when he um, when he first got a job at E Week, he came up to me and he said, uh, before he was at E Week, he had been freelancing for a while, and he'd been freelancing for I can't even remember who it was, which I feel bad about. Um, and he came up to me and he was like, it's "So weird. Now I'm at E Week. Everyone wants to be my friend." Before that, no one wanted to be my friend, and, and I wouldn't get invited to stuff, and people wouldn't offer me interviews. And now I'm at E-Week, and everyone loves me. Um, and you have to be careful of that, because you have to remember, like, the media space is a small space, and it's really easy for somebody who is Joe Blogger today to tomorrow write for the Washington Post. Um, in fact, I just had lunch with Andrea Peterson at the Washington Post, and before she was at the Washington Post, she was a blogger. Um, so you want to be really respectful of everybody and treat everybody as if they're worthy of your time and your interest um, and build relationships where you can because people do move around and it is a small world. Um, but in terms of like knowing how to approach people, just do your research. Check out their site, look at what they write, look at who their audience is, how well received it is. Um, just get familiar with, with the material. That's good to do whoever you're speaking to. Just be familiar with who they are and who their audience is and what they mainly focus on. It will, in, it will endear you to them if you know what you're doing in that regard. And it will also result in you having a better experience because you will have tailored your content to their level and will be less likely to burn yourself. Adam. Um, okay, so the there are upsides and downsides with exclusives. Um, the downside is obviously that if you offer someone an exclusive, then you have the potential that other media will be put off and they won't want to pick it up. Um, and it's highly competitive and you can burn relationships. There are certain people who get very offended if they don't get offered an exclusive and somebody else does. Um, so you have to be really savvy and you have to know what you're going into and make the decision with your eyes open. But the good things about doing it are, um, firstly, you can get an awesome piece of guaranteed coverage. Um, secondly, you can actually have a feedback loop with the reporter and that can help you build the story and refine it and hone it, make it better. And the third thing is that you build a great relationship with that reporter. If you give a reporter an exclusive that they are legitimately interested in and want, it makes them feel valued, and it also helps them raise their profile, and so they are much more likely to come to you for stuff in the future and to love you and, and want to have a relationship with you. So it is worth doing, but go into it with your eyes open. Um, typically with me, I tend to do a lot of exclusives with Reuters because Reuters get syndicated very heavily, so I get more bites at the cherry that way. Um, the other thing is I think about like which media compete directly with each other and which don't. So uh, for example, when Nick joined, um, both Reuters and CSO Online took it as an exclusive. Now it wasn't the biggest story, I'm sorry Nick, but it wasn't the biggest story in the world. And so they didn't feel too affronted by that idea. 
Um, so I could do a double exclusive, but it also worked because neither of those reporters consider themselves directly competing with the other. So you, you have to go into it being very sort of smart and savvy. The big thing with exclusives is if you offer an exclusive, you have to follow through with it. You really, you have to honor it. You can't like say to somebody they have an exclusive and then go say to somebody else. That will burn a relationship completely. Yeah, totally the cost of doing business. Yeah, um, the reality is that you, if you got a name check, that's a result. If you got a name check and it was accurate to what you said, that's a good result. And so, yeah, it's all good. I mean, you have to think about, like, coverage is a momentum game. One piece of coverage, who cares? Generally, I mean, like, if you think about the billions and billions and billions of words written every single day, um, one piece of coverage is not going to make any difference to anybody. So it's about kind of keeping the name check going over and over and over again. And so the more times that happens, the better. And you might get, like, just a one line and a piece tomorrow, but then because of the relationship that you kept going, the six months down the road, it could be a piece that's dominated by you. It's all good. Yeah. Yeah, and, and we've done that too. Like Todd and I, Todd and I went to uh, New Jersey and spent a day filming with NBC for a, a three-minute segment, full day. We, were, we thought it was great. We were like tourists. It was amazing. Anything else? All right. You've been amazing. Thanks ever so.